must say that most of the people I know are busier now than they were before. So I know you are equally as busy. So thank you for taking the time to all of you. We are, we are honored. M Michelle Giorgio, uh, who is with Vintage Wine Company as well, has been out to the winery and would like to share a wonderful experience that she had. Thank you so much. So I had the uh, distinct privilege of going to Catena Winery about five years ago now, um, at which time I had never been to Argentina or South America. Mendoza is a magical, beautiful place. Um, the Catena Winery is very special. It's, I would say, more of a modern style winery with the most fabulous uh, barrel room. We had so much fun there, and uh, when we were there, we went to the vineyards many times, and what blew me away was the most gorgeous setting, which were the Andes Mountains on one side, which are absolutely breathtaking. The winery on the opposite side, and then um, daily we would go through some delicious wines, and boy, do the Argentines know how to eat. We had a lot of meat, but one thing that was very special are their empanadas. And these lovely ladies would bring us boxes of empanadas every day, warm out to the wineries, which were fabulous. So if anyone has an opportunity to go to Argentina, head to Mendoza and visit the Catena Winery. It was special, magical, and uh, I hope to take my family and people from our, our wine company back there. So thank you. And uh, I'm enjoying a uh, glass of the Alta Chardonnay, which is very special wine from Catena. So with no further ado, I'd like to toast Laura and Jorge and Alfredo and all of the uh, people from Catena. Thank you for being with us and Brian. So cheers and Laura, take it away. Thank you so much, Michelle. Um, I just, I want to tell you uh, a quick story, which is that my father who, you know, he's very controlled with his drinking, and eating, you know, he doesn't eat too much uh, or drink too much. Uh, just the, the amount of really good wine. But when he is uh, faced with an empanada, he can eat up to 20 in one serving. And an empanada is like pretty big. It's like a slice of pizza. And it's the one thing when, when he is faced with empanadas, he can't stop himself. So he, you and, and he, uh, Michelle. We, uh, we have a lot of fun. Yeah, yeah. You, you might enjoy eating empanadas together. So, well, thank you so much for having me here today. Um, you know, these are difficult times, but we are all adapting in our own way. And as a physician, I've actually done a lot of research and reading about wine and health because, you know, um, I always wondered, actually, when I first um, started working with my dad, I actually asked him, I said, Dad, you know, how do you feel about selling alcohol? You know, like there's alcoholism. And he said, Laurita, you don't have to worry about a thing because we sell fine wine and there are no fine wine alcoholics, Brenda. <laughs> I kind of beg to defer, but, um, but you know, I do think that when you drink well and you enjoy uh, the taste of the wine, you drink in moderation. And the other message I want to give all of you is that you are essential workers, those of you who um, are working in the wine business, because wine in moderation has been definitively shown in multiple studies to help reduce the risk of strokes, heart attacks, dementia, up to 30%. I mean, that, those are like pretty extraordinary numbers. Um, and also uh, wine in moderation can help reduce uh, the sugars in diabetics. And even more importantly, there was a study done that showed that people who drink wine smile more. And you know, that's what we need to these days, but all the time. If we can smile more, uh, we enjoy life more. And so wine is a beautiful thing. And we in the wine world are essential workers. And, and we should remind ourselves of that every day uh, when you're going to your stores or going out and, and you know, maybe putting yourselves a little bit at risk that, that you are bringing joy and health uh, to the world. So thank you for that, all of you. Um, and so, well, uh, I actually also wanted to thank Ben Eberling who is here on, on this call and who I know was part of organizing this. Uh, and Mary, I already thanked her before, but so thank you, uh, Ben. And I would like to then share a little bit of our- Thank you, Laura. <laughs> okay, great. Thank you, Ben, for being here. So I'd like to share the screen uh, and show you a little bit of this beautiful uh, terroir, this beautiful place by the Andes Mountains.
that was uh, planted for the first time in my family, my great grandfather, Nicola Catena, who came from Italy to Argentina in 1898, planted his first vines in 1902. So we've been making wine in Argentina for almost 120 years. And uh, I'm hoping that uh, we can do this for another 100 years. That's, that's the vision of our winery, to continue elevating Argentine wine for another 100 years. So um, let me press the next. Oh, here I am actually sitting on the lookout at the Adriana Vineyard, and you can see the mountains in the background. And right now, if you go to the Instagram uh, at Catena Wines, you'll see some beautiful photos of uh, the vineyards covered in snow. So right now it's, uh, you know, the winter is going to start soon and there's just snow everywhere. There's snow in the mountains, there's snow in the vineyards, and it's really stunning. So um, a little bit of geography for those of you who have not been to Mendoza. So Mendoza is here, the, the, the area circled in yellow. Uh, by the Andes Mountains. And if you go all the way east, you go to Buenos Aires, which is, you know, the great capital with all the restaurants and the shopping. And I highly recommend if you come down to South America, make a little stop in Buenos Aires, go to Mendoza, and then you can step over to Chile, which is on the other side of the Andes. And, you know, they have um, beautiful wines there as well. This is a little map of the Appalachians of Mendoza. Many people uh, wonder, so what is Mendoza? You know, is it a state? Is it a region? And in Argentina, we have provinces. They're uh, what you call states, we call them provinces. And Mendoza is one of the provinces. So it would be like saying California. So when you think of Mendoza, you're looking at multiple different Appalachians. And there's um, over 25 different Appalachians in Mendoza. And this map is showing Luján de Cuyo, the Uco Valley in the south, and each appellation has a different kind of soil, a different kind of tradition, um, a different altitude, and so many things that make the wines from each region very different. And uh, when people ask me, you know, how should I get to know Argentine wine? I just recommend go and buy wines from different regions and taste them. And if they say Catena on the label, even better. Uh, so, okay, so how do um, we explain uh, the, the terroir, which, you know, is that French word that is a combination of soil and climate of Mendoza. And I like this uh, classification. This is the Winkler classification. It was done by a professor at UC Davis. And what he did was he, he added the, the degree days before harvest for different regions. And he came up with uh, four zones. Zone one, the coolest. Zone two, a little less cold. Zone three, warmer, zone four, the warmest. And if you go all the way to the right, you'll see international areas that you might recognize. Burgundy and Champagne is the coolest in, in Europe. Then you have, um, well, in France, I mean, you have Germany maybe is cooler. Bordeaux, Barolo, and Cote d'Iron is zone two. Napa Valley, Chianti Classico is um, zone three. And then Chateau Neuf du Pape is a little warmer, zone four. Now, if you were gonna go in France from Chateau Neuf du Pape to Burgundy and Champagne. It's about a seven hour drive. In Argentina, you go from Lulunta, the, the warmest part where we have a vineyard, to Gualtajari Highlands, and you do that in under an hour. So we have this extraordinary diversity of climate. And the reason for that is that you're going up in altitude. And as you go higher, it gets cooler. And Literally, you know, you're going to start at the city thinking, oh, I'm going to wear a t-shirt today. And then by the time you get to the higher altitude, I don't know if Michelle remembers this, it can actually get cold and you need to put a little jacket on. And I like to, sh to show this information because people think, you know, South America, it must all be warm. Like they're thinking, I'm going to go to the beach and the palm trees. And we do have, uh, you know, some warmer areas, but actually the beaches are better in Brazil and Chile. The, the men, people from Mendoza, you know, they like to go to the beach in Chile. Like Alfredo is here, my dear friend from Chile, and he loves the beaches in Chile. And, um, you know, we don't have very good beaches in Mendoza or in Argentina, but we do have this high altitude terroir and this cool climate. And it's hard sometimes for people to realize that you can make this really mineral Chardonnay because of this uh, high altitude. A little bit about the soil formation. So if you picture the formation uh, of the Andes 100 million years ago, you have these two plates. There's no Andes in the ocean. It's all covered by water. And then they start colliding. And then the Andes rise. 
And then about 40 million years ago, the, the Andes continued to rise, finish rising, and then they're covered with glaciers. And as the glaciers melt, they start dropping stones and different kinds of materials. So if you look at this uh, diagram, further up, you see stones and limestone. So if you go to some areas, you'll see these gigantic white stones and stones all over the soil. And this is really important because stones make the soil well drained and they make it uh, easy to produce low uh, quantity, which is what we want. We do not want very high yields. And so these, these are naturally low yielding vineyards. As you go down, you'll see more sands and all the way down is clay, which is also a, a, a good material because it can retain uh, a little more nutrients. And in each one of these different areas, you will have different flavors uh, for different varieties. And, and this is really the work of the Catena Institute, understanding what is the flavor of Malbec, what is the flavor of Cabernet Sauvignon and Chardonnay from each one of these areas. And I mean, it is so much fun to taste, you know, the same plant selection at a different altitude in a different soil and find them to be so extraordinarily different. So this is, um, an image that I really like because it kind of captures uh, what we're talking about when we say an altitude blend. And this is something that you can't really do in other parts of the world because you don't have these different climates at different altitudes. So let me explain a little bit what is what. And this is an explanation for this wine, the Catena Malbec, that I think some of you might be drinking. And uh, so at the top is Gualtajari. And when you look at meters, the easy math for feet is to just multiply by three. So Gualtasari, which is the highest part, um, I mean, when my father planted in this vineyard in Gualtasari, people told him the grapes would not ripen, that it was too cold. And you know, my, my father said, well, but I'm looking for cooler climate because that's how I get better acidity. That's why I get the more moderate alcohols. That's how I get more concentration. And he planted anyhow, because he thought maybe the sunlight and the altitude will still allow me to ripen, and it did. And, and this has become one of the most highly coveted areas. It's like our, you know, our Pomerol, or, you know, it's just so famous in Argentina, Gualtajari, uh, a lot has been written about it. But it's an area where there were no vineyards until my father planted in the early 90s. And from this area, we get a lot of florals, freshness, balance, and really beautiful grainy tannins. Altamira is, a, is an area in the southern part of the Uco Valley, this is an area that has a lot of big white stones. And in fact, when we plant a vineyard there, it's very labor intensive because you actually have to remove some of these stones because there's no root that's gonna go through the stones. And you'll see these beautiful um, kind of like uh, walls of stones lining the vineyards because we use them for, you know, to, to separate between two vineyards. Rather than a fence, we use stones. And then for Magrelo, which is the clay soils um, a little lower down, you know, almost 3,000 feet elevation, we get a lot of this spicy and spiciness and, and a, a mid palate texture. And then from Lulunta, it's a lot more ripe and black fruits. And when you put all of this together, you get this, this just really beautiful, um, elegant, balanced wine. And I, I like to call it our Chanel number no. five because it's, it's a classic, you know. Uh, this wine is used often in Master of Wine, Master Sommelier exams. Uh, it's very distinctive. It, it tastes like Malbec. It tastes like Adena Malbec. And, and the one way to, if you're ever in, in this situation of having a blind tasting, to tell the Malbec, uh, if you're confused, you're not sure what it is, is the, the palate. So Malbec from Argentina has very smooth palate. So the wine's going to be very, very dark. You're going to look at the color and you're going to say, wow, this has to be, you know, like some Bordeaux varietal, something really powerful. But then it's going to be smooth and velvety. And Malbec, which is uh, usually made dry, we, we don't add any residual sugar. We don't have a Malbec with residual sugar. It's very dry, but it'll taste a little bit sweet. And that's because of the polysaccharides. It's a, it's a, it's a part of the variety is that it has this slight touch of sweetness uh, that's natural. And if you taste that real velvety and that smoothness, um, it's probably a Malbec and it's a very dark in color. So this is a way to, to recognize Malbec. Uh, and if anybody wants to say something, I'd love to hear comments or, or Jill, is that going to happen at the end? Well, I'm, I'm looking here for questions. Feel free to ant, uh, ask away. If you look at the bottom of your screen, 
there should be either a chat or a question a q and a uh, please we lara is is so uh, informative what you've shared with us so far. Any other questions that you have, please feel free and share with us. Okay, great. So, yeah, they, can I, also, I, they can also unmute themselves. Oh yes, please. Okay. If, Perfect. If you, please interrupt me if you want me to clarify something. Um, I'd, I'd love any questions. And, and there is the Empire State Building and the Eiffel Tower in the bottom, just for you to get an idea. You know, that's, a, that's actually a comparative height to the mountains, you know, to these buildings that, that you might know. Okay, so Mavek, another thing that is very, very uh, near and dear to my heart. Um, when I started working with my dad, and Alfredo can remember these days, he sort of had to teach me everything because I didn't know anything. Um, all I knew is that I believed in my father's uh, dream to uh, make Argentine wines that could stand with the best of the world. And, you know, I believed in that. Alfredo believed in that. And, and all the people that, that worked with us then and that work with us now, all of you I know believe that Argentina can make wines that stand with the best of the world. But I had this kind of recurrent sort of bad moment that would happen to me when I would get interviewed by a journalist and they would often ask, um, Laura, what comes after Malbec in Argentina? And you know, I would be kind of shocked, you know, why are they asking me this? This is the variety that was planted by my great grandfather. Um, it's really ancient, it's been around for thousands of years. Why should there be something else? Um, and, but I often didn't know how to answer other than that. And I would often talk about, you know, we make great Chardonnay and we have this variety called Monarda and Provences. And I would talk about all, all these other things. And then one time somebody was really insisting that I had to say something next. And I said, well, would you ask Aubert de Vilaine, the owner of Romane Conti, what comes after Pinot Noir in Burgundy? And, um, and he said, well, it was actually a, a French journalist living in Quebec. He said, well, of course I wouldn't ask him that. And I said, well, you shouldn't be asking me. And, um, and we had this really great discussion uh, that led me to do a lot of research on the history of Malbec, uh, because I, I wanted to be able to, to answer with facts. And what I found in this journey was that really Malbec was like a very, very famous uh, variety in France. In fact, it was first recognized by the Romans when they, when they, you know, they walked through Gaul and they walked by the region of Cahors and they tasted the wines and they loved the wines and there's, you know, writings from, from those, uh, well, what was written afterwards about those days. Um, and then the, Malbec was also really well known in the Middle Ages at the court of Eleanor of Aquitaine, who was this famous queen. Uh, she was the queen of the court of love. Remember what you might've read of the troubadours singing love songs? That was her court and she brought Malbec from France, from Aquitaine to England and made it famous all over the world. She called it the black wine. And she lived till the age of 82, which in the 12th century to live till the age of 82 was like today living till the, the 120. And any theories of why she might've lived so long? She drank wine. Not just any wine. She, she drank, drank Malbec. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, so, that's the story of Eleanor. And then Malbec becomes very important again in Bordeaux. And this was something that I kept on asking all my friends from Bordeaux, like how important was Malbec in Bordeaux? And a lot of them didn't know because they, they didn't replant it after Philoxo. And then I did have Pierre Lausson from Cheval Dan tell me, listen, there was more Malbec in Bordeaux planted than Cabernet Sauvignon. And I said, oh my God, that's, in, that's crazy. And I never heard that. And then I actually did more research and in the Encyclopedia Britannica from 1889, um, it actually says there's more Malbec planted in the Medoc. And Malbec was used to blend with Cabernet Sauvignon because it was thought that Cabernet Sauvignon was too tannic and didn't have enough fruit. And so the Malbec was added to add texture and smoothness to the Cabernet Sauvignon. And it was widely used in Bordeaux. But the problem with Malbec was that it was very susceptible to rain and cold weather. So after the Luxor, when the French had to replant, they said, you know, we're not going to plant this delicate grape. We can get the softness from Merlot. And they had a lot, they just had a lot of problems with cold weather, like and yields going, you know, to 25%. And that was Philoxera, late 1800s. But Malbec came to Argentina in the 1850s. So by the time it was not being replanted in France, Malbec was thriving in Argentina. And we have this sunlight, the mountain climate. And for some reason, Malbec just does incredibly well in Argentina. It just makes this beautiful wine. It ripens well. 
it produces a different flavor in the different soils and altitudes. And it's, it's like a successful immigrant, you know, it found its home in Argentina. And then, you know, it was planted by my great grandfather, but actually in the 1960s and 70s, Argentina had this big economic crisis. We had military governments, inflation of up to 900%. And the growers couldn't produce enough grapes because Malbec is a low yielding variety. It's, it's, Malbec is, is, is a fine wine. It's not a, a variety made for volume. So actually a lot of the Malbec was being pulled out in Argentina. We were about to see Malbec go extinct in Argentina, like it almost had in France. And it was really my father who had the guts to um, decide I'm going to make a world-class Malbec, a Malbec that can stand with all those famous wines. And, and my grandfather actually encouraged him a lot because my father wasn't so sure as I feel I can tell you here, he would say, well, are we sure that Malbec can be as good as Cabernet? And his father, my nonno, that's what you call your, your grandfather in Italian, he would say, Nicolas, Malbec is just as good as all those French wines. And he traveled a lot to France, as did my father. And he, it was a lot because of his father that he said, okay, we're going to do all this research. We worked on plant selections, on figuring out the, the taste of place for Malbec and all the different regions, on how to make it so that it's you know, incredibly delicious. The, the initial flying winemakers that came to Argentina wanted us to make Malbec like you make Cabernet Sauvignon with long macerations and, um, you know, not uh, uh, like real cold at the beginning, the fermentation, no cold salts. And actually Malbec, because it has these really soft tannins, can be made in many ways like more like a Pinot Noir. And so once we started changing the winemaking, we started seeing like this, the beautiful, elegant Malbec. And uh, I think that you know, the Malbecs you're drinking today from our family and from many other families in Argentina are just at, at a whole other level. You know, even if this variety has been in Argentina for a long time, I think, you know, you're really tasting the best of it uh, right now. And, oh, and this is my dad. Uh, so my dad and I have been working uh, together since the mid nineties, uh, since I decided that I would share my life with, between medicine and wine. And I'm sure some of you here work with your family and, uh, I mean, it can be rough working with your family sometimes. And I have a lot of friends that tell me that, that it hasn't gone so well for them. But I happen to be very fortunate that I have a father who um, is just, you know, he is the youngest person I know because he's always excited about new ideas. You know, right now, you know, he's in quarantine, stuck in this little house. And every day he is having new ideas, supporting new ideas. Um, and um, he's just like one of the... I don't know, the most brilliant people I've ever met and so kind and so caring um, and just, I don't know, the best, if you want to call him business partner that, that I could ever have. And so, um, I don't know, it's, it's just been the, the, the greatest thing to work with my father on this and with so many other people like some of you who are here today. Um, so I wanted to show you this uh, because uh, please everybody get your glass because we're all gonna have to toast. Uh, so this is some news that we got actually in December, which is kind of crazy because we had no idea of what was gonna happen. Um, Drinks International called us to tell us that we have been nominated as one of the top 50 wine brands in the world. And you know, we were really excited. Drinks International is very well known uh, in, in Europe, um, maybe not, not as much in the US, and, you know, we said, okay, top 50, that's amazing. And then uh, uh, at some point in January, they called us to tell us that we had actually been nominated the number one most admired wine brand in the world. Like our little cadena in Argentina, like our little family winery, number one over all these famous wineries. And even the Drinks International people were kind of surprised. <laughs> and, and it's actually a completely anonymous survey of uh, wine specialists uh, in 48 countries who vote blind and we came up number one. And the, there were all these celebrations planned at ProWine, which of course we weren't able to attend. Uh, but today I have the, the great pleasure to celebrate with you and to thank you because, you know, when you get a hundred points, um, which despite also not believing we would ever get hundred points from Parker, we have in the last couple of years, we've got several hundred points that credit goes, you know, first to the vineyard, 
uh, and then to the team, to the winemakers, the viticulturists, um, the families that have worked with us for so many years, the bees, um, the plants. Um, but this award, this award also goes to you because if you weren't out there telling our story, convincing people of how great Argentine wine could be. And I, I, I know some of you on this call are also people who just like Atena. If it weren't for you, we wouldn't get this award. So um, I now have the opportunity to toast to you with a big thank you to all of you. And, and it's very special that Alfredo is here. Because, um, <laughs> thank you, Laura. This is the first time that I do this, mm -hmm. I talk about this award with somebody that so much should get the credit because when Alfredo started selling Catena, literally, I mean, nobody even knew Argentina made wine. You know, it was the most expensive wine from South America and he literally had to sell one bottle at a time. And so Alfredo, this award definitely goes to you in part, for sure. Um, so, so thank you, a big toast to you, Chin Chin. Salud. Um, so, um, yeah, so really exciting. As I told my dad, I don't know if we're gonna get this award again, uh, but uh, we have to find a way to, to celebrate with our friends around the world um, because we, we have to find joy in, in, in some, some, you know, small uh, successes. Uh, so, okay, so now uh, to the wine. Um, and I think, let's see. So guys, I, um, I think I'm gonna give the, the microphone to um, Jorge and Pablo, or should I continue going for another five minutes? What do you think, Jorge? Uh, they already know that you're supposed to go early, so if you want to pass it to Pablo, he can explain the wines. Okay, so guys, I have a commitment with my daughter. I'm really sorry. It was a last-minute thing and unavoidable. Uh, she's 15. Um, so I am so happy to, to get to see you all. I thank you so much for this opportunity. And um, please, if there's any questions about anything, please uh, send me an email. Um, also, I think Pablo and Jorge are going to tell you about my book, Vino Argentino. And my new book, actually, that was released in March, also rather bad timing, but it's available on Amazon. It's actually selling really well. Um, it's selling in UK, uh, Canada, and US. It's about the 12 most famous vineyards in the world. It's an illustrated book. So if you can um, take a look at it on Amazon or in other bookstores when they open, um, it's, it's actually gotten, it just got a really important award for wine history. I would love for you to spread the word about uh, my book. Um, and uh, so thank you for having me. And um, I'll, I'll see you all next time. And I'll, I'll, I'll leave the, the pros, uh, Pablo and Jorge, to talk about the wine. So, yeah, Laura, uh, Laura, yeah. before you go, oh, I, I stopped there. I stopped there. I, I posted the links. I posted the links okay. for the book in the chat. So if you, okay. you can go back and look at those links, uh, and, you'll, and you'll find them. Uh, <laughs> Okay. And, uh, oh, and also, if you want to follow the winery, we have a very active Instagram. It's oh at Catena Wines. And mm. uh, we have a Twitter at Catena Malbec. And we have a Facebook, Catena Zapata. And I also have handles, uh, Laura Catena for Twitter, Laura Catena MD. Uh, so please uh, follow us and share news, uh, tag us. Um, it's, you know, the, we can't see you, we can't go visit you. So we are very eager to hear news from all of you. If you have a bottle that you like, please uh, uh, post it and tag us. So, muchas gracias. Muchas gracias. Laura, thank you from everyone on this call. We are delighted to have you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Cheers. Okay, so I'm gonna go ahead and- Stay well. Okay, Paolo. So you can share the screen, Paolo. Okay. And just just catch up with the um if you can i i can and then you know we, we work together uh, okay you, you do it because i have it open but but you have the presentation <laughs> what well, i can do it and you just tell me next you know okay yeah it's only four slices so no problem okay can second please no problem Okay, so um, welcome everyone. My name is okay, can, can, you, can you see the screen? Can everybody see the screen? Yes, yes. Okay, good. So welcome everyone. My name is Paulo Pico. I work with Laura and Jorge. Uh, I work for Catena. 
And yeah, we have the pleasure to have Michelle down there in the, in the winery a, a couple of years ago. You should now come again, Michelle, and bring your family. <laughs> you should all come, guys. You should all come. Okay, so we're going to talk about the wine that Michelle actually is drinking, the Chardonnay. I'm drinking, I choose the, the cap. I, I couldn't open four bottles, sorry. I have been opening like a bottle every day for these presentations, and by the end of the week, I'm like a little bit, you know, so I decided to open just one wine per presentation. Okay, so, so the wine that, that Michelle is drinking and you have in your screen here is the, the Alta Chardonnay, 2017. Uh, I don't know guys if you are all familiar with the portfolio, but I, I assume you are. We do have the classic line that is the first red that we're gonna taste. Then we jump to the Catena Alta line and then we have all the Catena Zapata wines. Mm -hmm. uh, the deal with the Catena Alta line is basically select what we consider the historic rows out of our six vineyards that we own in Mendoza uh, in different locations, like Laura was explaining. So we go basically to our historic rows. Uh, first of all, we decide which vineyards are gonna be part of it, and then um, check the different rows. In the case of this Chardonnay, we select two different vineyards. We select uh, Adriana Vineyard, that is this very high altitude vineyard in a place called Waltajari and then Domingo Vineyard. Domingo Vineyard is in the same uh, department or district the, that the first one, but it's much lower. I mean, not much lower, but a couple of hundred meters lower. But both of them are in the, in the department of Tupungato. So uh, basically what we do with this, with this one is uh, simple. All the, most of the job is done on the vineyard is because we select there everything. Uh, if necessary, we lower the yields, but, but tr we try to keep it as natural as possible uh, in terms of the, of the yields. And then uh, we crush it uh, and we put it, in, we ferment it in oak barrels. Not necessarily new oak. We try to play with between new, second and third use oak uh, to keep the balance. The idea of this wine and most of the wines of our portfolio is to keep the balance between the freshness, the natural acidity that the grape have, and of course, the, the addition of the, of the oak influence in the wines. Uh, this wine have another, also another uh, technique that we, that we do to keep the balance, that is uh, keeping uh, some malic acid. You have a secondary fermentation. The first fermentation is the alcohol, the, the sugar into alcohol. The secondary fermentation is the malolactic fermentation. It's basically when, when the, the acid turns into malic acid in, into lactic acid. So the acid that you have in the skin of an apple turns into the acid that you have, let's say, on the, on the butter or the milk. So those wines are very buttery. Uh, probably they run the malolactic fully. In this case, uh, we run the malolactic uh, between 70 and some years 65%, and we keep 30% with the malic acid. This is also to keep the acidity that you feel on the sides of your tongue, that acidity that makes you salivate. That's exactly what we're looking in these wines, to look uh, for the balance. I don't know, guys, if, if you have, uh, some of you have this wine in your glass, but, but for me, it's an awesome wine. Uh, this Alta, also the Alta line, matches uh, the perfect balance in the portfolio for me. Um, between the, the quality you get in that wine and, and how much you are, you are paying for that bottle of wine, I love the Alta. It's a perfect, perfect, perfect balance. Um, any questions on the chart? No? Not all at once. I was so good. <laughs> I'm so good you answered everything, Pablo. But you, besides the fact that your fan club uh, did start chiming in to ask, uh, saying hello to you. Yeah, uh, I, can, I can see. <laughs> when I'm talking, I can see the message, but I cannot answer and talk at the same time. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so let's move to the Catena Classic. The Catena Classic Malbec, uh, that is the following wine. I I like to. I, I I mean, if you remember, if not Jorgito, you can you can definitely go to. To the to the to the slice where the, where you have the mountain, I think that that slice explains exactly what we are trying to do with the with the Catena Classic, this one. So as Laura was explaining, in the different regions where we own uh, different vineyards, you get different uh, characteristics of the fruit, especially of the Malbec. When you are talking about Chardonnay, you normally 
talk about the very, very high altitude because we want to look for, for that acidity. When you're talking about Cabernet, like the best place for Cabernet is the, is the Agrelo, you know? Uh, but when you talk about Malbec, Malbec have a, can adapt to different altitudes and every altitude will uh, give uh, different characteristics like you have in this chart. So the classic for me, the best explanation to explain the classic is this visual. We try, we play with uh, three different regions of these ones and, and we try to do a very balanced wine. The idea with the classic is that year after year, we look for that consistency. Like if you grab a classic Malbec for five or six, seven years ago, you open it and you make sure that always will uh, match the quality year after year after year. That's the main aim with the with the Catena Classic is doing a blend of the different regions or sub regions from Mendoza to get like a big picture of what Mendoza means in a bottle of Malbec. If you want to go, Jorgito, to the slides of the Malbec again, uh, yeah. and there we're gonna have a much more information about this wine. Uh, for this wine, no, the, the the Malbec, the classic. For this wine, no problem. For this wine, we we do use uh, some barriques. Uh, here, there is no new barrique at all. Uh, so we use second and third use barrique, and, and and the reason why is because what we want to show in these wines is the the blend of the different regions and that characteristic of spicy black fruits, and 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 we don't want to hide all those uh, beautiful characteristics that this Malbec have uh, with too much oak. For me, the the oak. Um, the oak influence is like the pairing with food, you know, that the wine doesn't have to kill the food or the food doesn't have to kill the wine. The oak is exactly the same. The, the oak have to complement with the wine and doesn't have to kill it, the wine, all the flavors. And that's, that's what we try to do all across our portfolio. You're gonna see uh, every time that you open a bottle of Malbec, of course, or from Catena. <laughs> okay, now, uh, any questions on the Malbec? Yes, yeah, feel, feel, free, uh, feel free to ask questions. Um, there is really no need to raise your hand. Uh, when, when we pause, you can just feel free and ask any questions. Over here. I have to tell you that, that this Malbec is a... So, sometimes when you think on Catena, you think on the 100 points or, or you think on the, on the very special wines, the special labels that we always release. You know, you, you think on all that. And I have to say that this is, uh, this is like like the, the heart of the, of, the, of the winery. This is the, the single label that we uh, sell most in, in all across the, the world. And, and it's one of the most difficult wines to make because when you go to the very high-end wines, you have everything you want. You have like, I don't know, the best vineyards and, and this and that, and you can choose and you can ask as many things as you want. But then when you have to go to this wine that you have to make a bigger volume, matching the quality year after year uh, is a real challenge uh, and it's a wine that, that we work a lot and we are very proud of it. As you should be, you do it very well. It's been consistent year after year and as you mentioned Pablo, you sell it throughout the world. Um, everyone knows Catena Malbec. Yes. Okay, yeah, so, so Pablo, I did have one question and uh, I'm positive I'm trying to stay muted because my uh, kids are having dinner with me at the moment. Hi, Pablo. Good Hi. to see you again. Um, so I was, I was going to ask, so uh, a, a project like that and a, a winery with longevity like yours, um, you've been, obviously been making it for a very, very long time. Has the, the thought process or the evolution um, behind the, the flavor profile changed at all? Anything you've changed winemaking wise in the last, um, you know, however many years you've been making it? Well, you know, the, uh, definitely there have been changes. Uh, we have been adapting like like the market um, the plants have been uh, maturating uh, if you want to go uh, on the history uh, before the 80s um, or in the 70s we do have vineyards in other regions that they were more massive uh, they were giving more volume then uh, when nicolas uh, uh, handles the winery he start planting it higher and higher so when the the time passed we start learning uh, with the with the, the the regions that we were discovering and i i totally think that we have changed um, but this change I, I wouldn't call them change we have been adapting adapting to the new soils 
the new terroirs, uh, the new techniques. Uh, before the before the eighties or the seventies, we used to do much more the, the oxidative method, like the big Italians uh, style with all the we call them cubas. They were the big these big oak tanks. Uh, then we start introducing uh, the French barriques and, and start using more the protective method. And, and, and yeah, of course, that, that there, uh, there have been a lot of changes uh, or adaptations, I would say. We have been adapting to the to different uh, knowledge that we have get or experience that we have been getting during all these hundred years. Pablo, um, also I think what has changed and, um, and it helps the consistency of the wine. Um, Alejandro Vigil, the winemaker, he told us that they started harvesting also some components of the wine earlier. And that is to also lower the alcohol and to bring a little more acidity and brightness to the blend of the wine. Yes, when, when Alejandro came on board in the year 2000-2001, uh, he, uh, he was the one that, that started working with, with, uh, with different components. Uh, so he started picking uh, a lot of uh, times in the same vineyard. In the past, we used to pick everything at once now we, we start to picking um, sometimes with 10 or 15 days of difference between the first and the second pick in the same vineyard and that's exactly for for doing what Jorge was mentioning to look for for a component that have much more acidity more freshness then you, you leave uh, something for the for the end uh, to have much more body and a little bit heavier um, and some more sweet tannins uh, and then once you have all these components yeah, you can you treat them separately like different wines and then you start tasting them uh, and by doing that you can uh, get to a to a blend that is consistency year after year <coughs> Pablo there is a question about irrigation uh, yes I ask if um, you know which irrigation do we use I, I was typing to him saying that normally most of the vineyards now are drip irrigation and you, are, and you are converting the Angelica vineyard, which is the oldest vineyard, to drip, but you just don't change the vineyard, you have to replant and, and adjust, right? But most of that, that was probably the last vineyard that you do flow irrigation, right? From Cateca. Yes, uh, I mean, water, we have to understand that, that in this high altitude desert that we are located in, that is Mendoza, water for us is gold. Uh, just to give you guys an idea, only 5% of the total surface of Mendoza is cultivated and the only limitation that we have is the water. When I said cultivated, it's not with uh, vineyards, it's cultivated, period, anything. And so uh, water is, for us, is gold. So what we do um, is drip irrigation to take advantage as much as possible of the water. And when you flood irrigate, you, you lost a lot of, of water that drains, basically. Uh, and that's why we, we are trying to convert everything into drip irrigation. But sometimes when you have uh, such an old vineyard, uh, it's difficult to it's difficult to to switch it just just like like switch it because uh, the plant imagine that the plant as a person ninety years uh, that person was used to be feeded in certain way and then when when that person is ninety years old you want to change the regimen and that that's not possible that plant is gonna die so it takes time to adapt that plant from flood. To, to drip and in some cases you just have to replant uh, that same plant, keeping the same the same uh, uh, food but replant. So uh, the next uh, wine, uh, the next wine that that we are gonna I don't know any more questions of the of the of the um, classic Malbec. No more questions. Okay, so the, the next one. Oh, yes, yes, one more question. I'm sorry. Uh, uh, Kim is asking that, uh, or is ask, yeah, asking you if, um, if uh, the, the 2020, you know, the, the latest uh, vintage, uh, your earliest harvest ever, uh, if it was climate change this year, you know, like everything was early, that was actually good that happened because of the COVID and everything that was going on. You know, we were, uh, that I, I always said that, that things happen just just because and and it was i'm not sure if it was the earliest because the 2016 was very early as well 
but I, I won't say this was the earliest, but it was very, very early. And, and this was, a, I, I would say, a miracle because uh, COVID hit Mendoza around the 15th of March uh, or the second half of March. And that was exactly when we were finishing all the, all the pickings. And, and actually, we have a, a very nice history here about picking with, with COVID. Uh, that was, uh, we always hire people from the, from the little towns uh, around the vineyards to work as interns, uh, helping us, picking. And then when COVID uh, impact Mendoza, uh, basically you couldn't circulate freely from region to region. So uh, we wouldn't, it wouldn't be able for us to finish the harvest if it wouldn't be for these people that were living next to the village where the plantation were, that they didn't have to travel from village to village. So uh, I, I like to say that everything happens uh, because of a reason. We don't know what's the reason for COVID, but I can tell you that this year, Mother Nature sent us COVID, but then sent us a very, very early ripen uh, harvest. And I wouldn't say having the earliest, but it's one of the earliest for sure. Okay, so uh, I hope that I answer uh, most of the questions. I will move forward to the to the Catena Alta Cabernet Sauvignon. Uh, so I, I told you about the, the Chardonnay that loves the super high climate, uh, high altitude, cool climate, and then uh, the Malbec can adapt basically to many many different uh, soils or altitudes. And the Cabernet mainly likes a little bit more. It can it can go to the to the high altitude uh, to the high altitude uh, vineyards. But remember the concept behind the Alta: are the rows that year after year give us the best results? Are the historic rows? So in order to select our historic rows, we went a little bit to the to the vineyards that are uh, lower in altitude. When I said lower, I'm not being fair because any of the vineyards that are part of the of the Cabernet Sauvignon are, are low at all. But the, I would say that, that the, the main, the main um, vineyard that we use here is the same vineyard that we use for Nicolas Catena Zapata Cabernet, that is uh, Agrelo, is the La Piramide vineyard. La Piramide vineyard have a, a particular soil that is a, that have clay, have like a meter and a half of clay topsoil before finding uh, rocks. That clay acts as a, as a bumper between the different temperatures. So when you have like a meter and a half of clay, it's very dense. First of all, it can retain water. And second, keeps the, the, under, under, the under the soil, keep it very cold. So even though uh, in the surface in the summer is hot underneath, is very cold. When you measure the soil temperature, it's very, very cold. And that's because of the clay. That helps the Cabernet, this uh, stability helps the Cabernet to maturate, um, to maturate in a very efficient way and always uh, get the maturation point. The, the difficulty of Cabernet is getting mature uh, without being overripe. So that's, that's uh, basically what we are looking for this cap. Uh, in terms of the of the fermentation process, uh, well, regular fermentations, and then we use here instead of the 225 liters uh, barriques, here we start using also some bigger barriques, uh, 500 liter barriques. Basically, to just to to make it brief, uh, the advantage of of playing with two different sizes of barriques is uh, that in 225 liter barriques, you have much more contact. Uh, the liquid have much more contact with the oak. In the 500 liter barriques, the liquid the liquid have less contact. In a thousand liter barriques, the the liquid even less. So uh, when you go bigger in barriques, the the oak influence is going to be much more delicate in, into the wine. Uh, and again, uh, what I have been repeating, the idea of this is keeping the the balance in this wine. Another very important thing that we that we that I didn't mention is that I would say that um, 85 or 90 percent of our wines are uh, aged in, in French oak, 
Uh, most of them you are going to see that says French oak, and that's something important. We like to play with different type of oaks, uh, different countries, mainly French. And, and a little secret about this wine, this uh, Alta Cabernet Sauvignon, is that every year, uh, in the past couple of years, we have been adding a small percentage of Cap Franc. Uh, in the, by the law in Argentina, you can set uh, in the label a, a varietal if 85% uh, of the wine is that varietal. So you can play with it 15% uh, without the necessity of mentioning it in the label. And that's why we, we basically don't mention it in the label, but, but we like when we do these uh, uh, smaller oh, yeah. presentations, we like to see it uh, and, and it's kind of nice to keep it uh, the wine a little more. Right. So then have some of the cheese and then taste it again and you're going to see that it's going to be a different taste. That's a question. Probably not. Okay, uh, I don't know, guys. Have you? I mean, this is the wine I choose for today. I told you I choose one wine. This is it. That was the one. I That's love the one. This That's the one. Yep. Thank you. you know, I said, um, just wanted to ask you one quick question about uh, about that wine, Pablo. Um, so the the native yeast. I noticed you guys uh, are in wild yeast. Um, note that on there. Has how long have you been doing that, and what do you feel like that's contributed to what you're doing? Uh, you mean the natural yeast? Yes, exactly. Mm -hmm. Yes. Well, for f first of all, uh, uh, in order to to uh, finish the fermentation with natural yeast, you have to be in a place. Uh, <laughs> I want to say like Mendoza, but there are many places in the world like this. You have to have a, a wine. Uh, you have to have a vineyard that do have a lot of uh, natural yeast, because uh, when you have a vineyard that is all urbanized on the surround. Um, like it's not possible to do it all with natural yeast. Uh, personally, what I think that, that uh, for all of our wines, the natural yeast does a little bit of characteristic of its own terroir. The natural yeast, like the name says, is natural yeast. It's not selected yeast that comes from France or from anywhere. So basically, it's the yeast that the same environment uh, gives it into the, into the vineyards. And so, uh, what we are, what, why we fight to always try to finish the fermentation with natural yeast is to, it's for the characteristic of the, of the different regions. And that's why we keep on doing it, even though it's a big, a big risk because uh, it can be uh, possible that, that you don't finish the fermentation. That's the worst thing that can happen ever. So, so with a very high risk, we try, we, we want to, to go for that uh, risk and, and leave it with natural yeast to give the characteristic of that place. Pablo, um, I just wrote in the chat a, a correction. Um, on the harvest report, I wrote Malbec um, instead of Cabernet. But I explained the principle is actually for all the varietals. And whoever was typing was thinking about Malbec. That's how Brainwash Argentina is about Malbec. So it is actually, in this case, it's Cabernet Sauvignon, but it could be applied to any varietal. It could be anyone because it, it is just logic, you know, what it says there. Yes, <laughs> yes, I, I saw it, yes. Okay. It's also... Uh, yeah, I know, I know. I really, I was like, okay, whatever. <laughs> okay, um... There's someone asking something here, Rujito? Somebody's asking, yeah, um, I'm, I'm reading it. Um, my favorite Catena has always been the Malbec, but after hearing you talk about the Chardonnay, I had to open that too. <laughs> now I'm really curious about the Cabernet. All the, all the Catena wines, you know, the, the Kia Catena is that we work with three main varietals, which is Chardonnay, uh, Cabernet Sauvignon, and Malbec. And, um, and I say the makeup sometimes is a little bit of Cap Franc or Petit Verdot. I mean, um, even Alejandro lately is now revealing that, that some, of the, some of the Malbec is blended actually in the field with Semillon, a little bit of Semillon in one of the old vines. But, um, you know, that's how, they, that's how they, they, they used to plant in the past and the blend was actually done in the vineyard. And obviously when you harvest, it goes into the, into the barrel. And as an example, you have a lot of the Portuguese wines that they have 30, 40 different varietals in one, in one wine. 
Uh, also, there's something very curious uh, from Catena that uh, we have in this meeting, Alfredo Bartolomeo that introduced Catena in the US and wouldn't allow me to lie. But the first wine that we introduced in the US market was the Chardonnay. Then the second one was the Cabernet and the third one was the Malbec. So that, that's, uh, we have a very long history with Chardonnay in Catena. Uh, and well, nowadays, uh, one of our latest, um, I would say, successes have been two Chardonnays, the White Stones and the White Bones. They both belong to the Catena Zapata line. Uh, they both come from Adriana Vineyard. Uh, and there are two Chardonnays uh, that we are selling uh, very, 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 very good and very allocated. Uh, they come in, in cases of three and have been very well uh, recognized for uh, most of the snobs in the wine uh, industry. Pablo, okay. right. then when you go into the last wine, this, this is supposed to be the special and surprise wine. So uh, please go deep into it. <laughs> yes, yeah, sure. <laughs> That's my sample. <laughs> oh, great. Did, did you say I have also, yeah. Oh, thank you, Jorge. Pour me a glass. <laughs> yeah. I, I, I don't know, I don't know if, if I'm allowed to do this, but, but I will tell the story and, and I will tell about this wine and I would love because I would love, I, I'm improvising now and, and you can definitely tell no, but, but Alfredo, if you want to share with us the story of how the Nicolas Catena Zapata was introduced, uh, that will be a, a, something very special even for me because hearing from you that you were there will be very special. So I will go ahead and I will talk yeah. about the, the wine itself. And then if you want to share the story with us, that's okay. If not, I will try to no, reproduce. That's, it. that's okay, Pablo. I think that, you know, uh, people in general, uh, sometimes they're a little snob because they were brought out uh, that some of the best wines, you know, they were French. Not that they are no good, they're very good wine. So when you come from the new world with a wine that you want to uh, sell at $100 a bottle, then a lot of people say, you're crazy. I say, there's no wine from South America that can sell for that much. So what we did, uh, we uh, did a blind tasting uh, in eight cities in the United States. We picked wine uh, like Lafitte, uh, Chateaubriand, wine that they were selling twice as much of the price of uh, Catena. And to make the story short, uh, by the end of the eight cities, 80% uh, of the people in the tasting, the people that went into this tasting, they were sommeliers, some of the best palates in America. They were so surprised that a wine, uh, that all of a sudden they liked a wine that it was coming from a country called Argentina and the name was Catena. And that set Catena uh, at a higher level and they realized that the myth that in order to get a world-class wine had to be French or had to be California at the time. Uh, actually, uh, we, one of the wines from California that we picked was Opus One. Uh, it's a very, very, very good wine, but somehow 80 or 90 percent uh, of those very good palates across America, they prefer as uh, Nicolas Catena Zapata as being the best. Wow. That's, that's fantastic. That's, that's a story that that I have been uh, hearing from Alfredo and, and from from most of the of the of the people Jorge that have been working with the family for many years, but but it's for me it's, it's very eye opening. Uh, when Nicolas was doing this wine, uh, the first vintage was 1997. Uh, Alfredo came out with this idea of presenting it uh, this way, uh, and it was very risky because at that time, imagine if if the if the results were good that we know now that were good. Um, uh, was a boom, like everyone will, uh, will be really excited. But what happened if it was bad was the end of, uh, for, for, for this line of Catena. So, so it was very risky, but, but I, I know that some of you knows Nicolas and I hope that all of you know Nicolas in some point. He, he, liked, he loved to take those risks and he's a person that, that is, doesn't have fear of, of this. Like he didn't have fear of go. 5,000 5, feet and plant in, in Waltaderi, he was not fear about competing uh, the French or the Americans. 
And so this is uh, how we, we introduced this wine. A very, very uh, interesting way in that time. So I was uh, looking at the, at the questions. The first vintage was 97 and the presentation was in 2001. Uh, well, this wine, as I mentioned, uh, the, the base of this wine is a uh, Cabernet Sauvignon. And this wine, uh, the Cabernet Sauvignon, comes uh, from La Pyramide Vineyard, that is in Agrelo. It's in this place that I was mentioning that we have a, a lot of clay, a topsoil, a very big topsoil of clay. And, and it's the, for us the ideal place uh, for Cabernet Sauvignon. We do have some old plants uh, of Cabernet Sauvignon there. They are uh, close to 40 years, 40, 40 plus years old uh, vineyards of, of Cabernet Sauvignon. Uh, and from there we source uh, the, the main, the heart of this wine. Nicolas Catena Zapata always is gonna be more Cabernet Sauvignon than Malbec. This is the idea of this wine. And this has been always since the beginning. Uh, actually, in the beginning, it was close to 90, 10. Uh, and now we are moving a little bit closer with Malbec. And, and this particular vineyard, a uh, vintage, sorry, the 15, uh, was 83% cap, 17% uh, Malbec. The Malbec comes uh, from these two superstars vineyards that I call them. Adriana Vineyard, we have been talking about this vineyard. It's the highest vineyard planted in, in, in Mendoza. Um, and then the other vineyard is Nicasia. Nicasia is this place that Laura was telling that for planting you have these big rocks that you have to remove, so you plant it. It's in a place called Paraje Altamira. And mm -hmm. so I would say that these two places are the, the hottest places in Mendoza. Not hot because it's warm, they are very cold, but hot because everyone wants to have a spot there. And, and unfortunately, or not, there's no more uh, rights of irrigation in those places, so uh, they are gonna stay as big as they are, that they are not very big. Uh, in in Paraje Altamira, only I would say 10 producers have been there, they are very, very small uh, place uh, where Nicasia come from. So uh, playing with these two components of Malbec and the main heart of the wine that is Cabernet Sauvignon, uh, we do this blend. As I mentioned, uh, playing every, every year changing. Uh, this is a blend that, that Nicolas itself, uh, Nicolas, of course, as you can imagine, he's in every decision in the winery, but uh, talking about the wines, uh, this is the, the wine that he's always uh, supervising there, the wine, uh, always choose the final blend, it's always uh, his decision, uh, and, and well, I, I, it's one of my favorite wines of, of the whole portfolio, if not my favorite. Um, this wine spends around between a, a year and a half or two years, depending on the year, in, in French oak barriques. Uh, in this case, they are all new. Uh, and the fact that we, that we use new barriques is that uh, this wine have a lot of tannins. Uh, naturally, when we pick these wines are from lower, uh, lower yields uh, parcels. So they have much more tannins, they have much more structure, and they can handle much more oak. And this is the idea for keeping the balance that we, that we use a little bit more of new oak here. Jorgito, I don't know if you want to uh, talk some, I mean, I can be talking about Nicolas for a long, long time uh, about this wine. I, we have a lot of stories about this wine. No, this wine, we can talk forever. Um, I think I wrote in the chat that next, next year we're launching the set. Uh, we still have to go through the 16, but when we do the 17, the 2017, it will be the 20th anniversary. Yeah. Um, and I hope we find some bottles. That's why, I, that's why we found Alfredo. Maybe he has some 97 in his house still. <laughs> we, need, yeah, we need to show that this wine has actually aged. That was the big question in the past, if, um, if uh, Argentine wines will age. And I know for sure that they do. Um, it's, been, it's been officially from for Catena 20 years since they have the high end. But when we go to Malbec camp um, uh, in Mendoza, we actually taste the classics from the 90s and they're beautiful. They're aging very well. Uh, this is a wine that in the, in the market, the perspective has been a little dark because of the, the, the excitement of the white bones and the white stones and all these Malbecs that they're coming out. But, uh, but I think this is probably the best wine um, when it comes to aging and flavor and more Bordeaux-like wine that, that we produce. 
And, and the value today is probably 30% less than what it was when they launched it in 2001. So um, we're gonna do good things with this wine. Um, yeah. Hopefully uh, whatever is happening today passes soon because I can't wait to go in an airplane. I don't know what to do anymore. I got used to flying like for 20 years. Now I'm sitting at home, so. My, and I miss Michigan, especially in the winter time. Mary can tell you about that. <laughs> So again, feel free to ask questions. Um, that was the last one. Um, if uh, Mary or Ben or um, Jill, uh, Michelle, Brian, anybody, anybody wants some yeah, questions? Let me, let me, because I'm going to have to jump off the call here in a little bit, but uh, yeah, I definitely do want to thank Vintage Wine and uh, their staff and their sales professionals, the ownership and the management. Uh, I've been very big proponents of uh, selling Catena in Michigan and a very big help to myself. So some good kudos, big kudos to, uh, to Ben, who we worked with in Plum Markets, and of course with Michael and Mary from Winebow supporting the brands. Uh, I'll always get Michael to you know, keep cash and checks and send them in your way, uh, the, the best that I can always do. Uh, but just uh, a couple other things is a, a big kudo also to, uh, to Big Mac McDonald. He's a bulldog in the chains. And uh, I did have a meeting with Lisa Lyon from Meyer. And uh, we are looking at submitting uh, outside of Melbeck the Cabernet and Chardonnay because of the scores and the, the velocity of the wine and IRI. I've been doing fantastic within our state. Uh, Stacy Lavarell, God love her. That woman knows the shoreline like nobody else does uh, at that company. Sells a ton of wine in Spartan and DNW. I know her uh, beloved uh, 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 Roz is not in the chain anymore, but she continues to success or excel and succeed. Um, good to see you on the call also, Alfredo, blast from the past. Yeah. My God, Alfredo, great to see you. <laughs> so, um, but uh, Vintage Wine, I know they are totally committed to selling these brands and expanding the distribution. But as I said, the ownership and the management, Jill and her staff, uh, the office staff, even in the warehouse, one of the cleanest warehouses I've ever seen in my life. Uh, phenomenal com uh, company and uh, great job to all of you guys. And, uh, Continued success. I have water. I sorry, I don't have any wine with me, but uh, gotta love Vintage Wine Company, the Giorgio family, and uh, everyone that works with them. So, thank you again for everything that you've been able to help us achieve. And thank you, Brian. Thank you very much, Alfredo. That was Brian Reno. Okay, well, it was nice to you, uh, Pablo and Jorge. The great lunch. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> well, one advantage to being in this industry is for as long as I have is I've got to work with every one of you. I've had Alfredo and, and Pablo and Jorge and the most fun experiences of, of what you share with your food and wine knowledge. Uh, it, those are memorable events. And I think especially now we're all really looking forward to getting together again and we can make more memories and have those those great dinners together. Uh, so we look forward to a, a very healthy and, and happy end of this uh, year. But thank you all for, for sharing what you've done with all of us. I also want to mention too, I think I saw in the, uh, the names there, uh, I think we have Mary Pearl here. We do. Along with us, correct? Mary, how yeah. are you? <laughs> no, Mary Pearl, uh, Bushes, correct? Yes, she's on, oh, and then also Ronnie Barco from Casa del Vino. That is a great. Oh, Ronnie! Long time, Long time Ronnie. As well, okay. every time I walk in the door, he shrugs because he knows he has to spend money. No. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good thing. No, also, um, Pablo, before the, before they leave, um, if you have uh, clients that want to do these things. Right now, we're in the process of uh, something new. It's called the hybrid tastings, because now I'm actually going live to some of these places where, where it's allowed. So we're doing um, like the live presentation, and it's also broadcasted to customers. So people that don't want to go to, to the event, they can actually see it on Zoom, and they can order wine. And I mean, we will do anything to promote the wines, and, uh, and I think we need to um, recover, you know, the, the difficult times from April and May, but, um, you know, I I think, uh, I think it's not too bad, and, and uh, Pablo is the big asado man. He loves to grill, so so go to your country clubs or restaurants, or even or even when you have a, a live meeting, we can go there and cook for you. We'll be happy. Right. 
Well, Pablo is still scheduled to come here in September. So September is too late. I'm talking about June, July, August. I do, my planning now is very short. <laughs> hey, yeah, Pablo, what's the, uh, I'll drive there. Hey, Pablo, Jorge, what's the chance of getting some uh, un uh, 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 barrels sent to Michigan for displays that uh, will not go back into circulation for aging? We cannot. We, we don't. We cannot bring them from. Uh, from Argentina, but what, what I've been doing for other places is that we order them in America, and we can add um, a catena, um, you know, like they paint the name catena on the barrel, and yeah. but the original ones, the original ones is too, you see, it's probably too expensive to bring from Argentina, but but we have a source of barrels in America. I think they come from Oregon, and um, there are always programs. I mean, get together with Brian, um, Mary, and, and and us, you know, and, and we'll, we'll work it out. We never no to anything, you know. Brian, this is a this is a problem of, of the 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 border customs. Uh, okay. Bringing wood from from other countries is kind of challenging. Understood. And then maybe so we Michigan can get him here. Can go down and make a catena blend for Michigan and blend their own wine, and you can ship them their wine, and we can promote okay. that. In so <laughs> great idea. No Let's go. <laughs> there was also a shout out from I get uh, Giovanni's. A couple people are eating lasagna. Why they're having Catena wines tonight? It nice. sounds amazing. I heard the lasagna is pretty good over there. Yes, I have to agree. One of my favorites. <laughs> I shipped them to Atlanta and Chicago this last Christmas. People that have requested Giovanni's lasagna. Wow, I, I haven't tasted them. <laughs> they loved them. Hey, I also saw on the thread too is uh, Neil Ronick is now on the team, huh? Neil, Neil is a uh, part of the Kalamazoo team, and hello, Ryan. Neil, how are you there, Ryan? Ryan? That Swast guy knows Ann Arbor and the shoreline like the back of his hand. <laughs> Another great guy to have on the team. Yes, um, I also I also see uh, Christy from Hello Vino is on. How are you? I can't wait to get up to the Traverse City area and and see you again. Thanks for joining in. Great. Well, good to see you, Neil. I saw your name there. I'm like, I know that guy. <laughs> Christy, thanks hey. for your support. Thank you. This was wonderful. Hi, Christy. What's this schematic we have in the background for Christy there? What's she getting ready to build? That is a uh, wine and food pairing chart because I can never remember. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Our motto is just drink more, it all comes together. <laughs> it, all, it all melts together, man. It all, it all right. Becomes... Right. Okay, well. Thank again. you, everyone. This was awesome. This was great. I'm looking forward to do it again and just stay in touch. I mean, I will be, I will stay in touch. Thanks very much for all your support and, and hope to see you soon. We hope to see you soon. Likewise. Stay safe, yeah. everyone. And uh, remember, wine is good for our health. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> if Dr. Laura says, I can do it. That, yeah. Dr. Agreed. So, so Laura, where's everyone? Laura says. Follow Dr. Zolder. Thank you, everyone. Cheers, Thank you, everyone. Cheers, everyone. Nice to see you. Thanks, Pablo. Take care, Jorge. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you.